is now uh, 12 p.m. EST, and we will now reconvene the meeting to begin the next session. Um, during the session, we will hear safety updates for COVID-19 vaccines on behalf of the VAERS team by Dr. John Su and on behalf of the VS team by Dr. Nikki Klein. Um, I will provide a summary assessment by the uh, VAST working group, and Dr. Hannah Rosenblum will present the benefit-risk discussion for use of Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine in individuals 16 years and older. Um, so uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Sue, if his slides could go up. Thank you. Dr. Sue? Hi, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? We can. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, next slide, please. So just the usual disclaimers. Next slide, please. And next slide. So as of August 18, Ferris had received a total of 2,574 reports of myocarditis or myocarditis with pericarditis, which collectively I will refer to as myopericarditis um, moving, uh, moving forward um, after COVID-19 vaccination. And of these, um, 1,903 were reports of myopericarditis and 671 reports for pericarditis alone. Next slide, please. This slide presents preliminary myopericarditis reports to bears following COVID-19 vaccination. You can see the breakdown on the left by manufacturer and on the right by uh, dose number. And we can see that consistent with past updates, um, we see more reports of myopericarditis after dose two relative to dose one. Next slide, please. This slide presents some characteristics of preliminary reports of myopericarditis to VAERS after known mRNA vaccination, sorry, mRNA COVID-19 vaccination through August 18th. Um, characteristics are list, listed on the left with dose number reported on the right. And again, these data, uh, although updated, reflect what's been observed in the past. Median age among persons reporting after dose two being younger relative to dose one, Median time to onset somewhat shorter, two days after dose two versus three after mRNA, sorry, dose one vaccines, and uh, greater preponderance among males relative to females. Next slide, please. So this slide um, reports the estimated expected versus observed reports during the seven days after uh, vaccination with mRNA vaccines after dose two. You might note that the age groups between 12 and 29 years are asterisk, and that's to indicate that the observed cases reported here were verified by provider interview or medical record review to meet the CDC definition for myocarditis. The uh, reports for ages 30 through 65 years were identified by automated computer search um, looking for standardized codes assigned to these reports indicating myocarditis. And so there's a bit uh, sort of an, um, so the um, asterisk age groups sort of represent a bit of a lower bound in that um, we might actually have counts a little bit higher than what you see here. Conversely, among the age groups 30 to 65 years, um, this sort of represents an upper bound in that some of these cases will probably rule out um, in comparison to case definition. And so the counts might actually be a little bit lower than what you're seeing presented here. Also, I'll make note that the estimated expected counts are presented as a range because the background rate for myocarditis itself is a range of about one to 10 per 100,000 person years. Um, so with that being said, what we see is that among males aged 12 through 49 years, and then among females aged 12 through 29 years, we do see more observed cases than are estimated to be expected for this time period. Next slide, please. In this slide, we present estimated expected versus observed uh, reports during the seven days after vaccination, after Pfizer-BioNTech's vaccine for dose two, and consistent with past updates for ages 12 through 49 years among males, and among females 12 through 24 years, we do see um, more observed cases than are estimated to be expected during this time period. Next slide, please. And this slide presents the estimated expected versus observed reports after uh, Moderna's vaccine after dose two, 
during the same seven-day risk period. Um, among ages 12 through 17 years, there's almost no reports, which might be anticipated given that Moderna vaccine is not authorized in these age groups. Aside from that, among males ages 18 through 49 years and among females ages 18 through 29 years, we again see um, more cases observed than are estimated to be expected during this time period. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the care patients have received and their outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, among persons aged less than 29 years of age reported errors after COVID-19 vaccination, we've identified 1,339 preliminary reports of myocarditis, of which 742 uh, were determined to meet the CDC definition for myocarditis. Of those 742, uh, 701 were hospitalized. The majority of those were discharged, and of patients discharged, over three quarters were known to have recovered from symptoms at time of report. Next slide, please. Just a brief mention about reporting rates. Next slide, please. So this is a very busy slide that on the left presents by age group the different reporting rates by manufacturer, then by sex, then by dose number. And what I would draw your attention to are those columns on the left in light green. And I think the real take home point behind this slide is that regardless of uh, age group or manufacturer, we tend to observe higher reporting rates after dose two relative to dose one. I'll make note that for ages 12 to 15 years, we did not calculate a reporting rate for Moderna simply because the numerator and denominator were so small, the resulting reporting rate was a clear outlier that, was, that would be beyond uh, what would make any sense. And so to avoid confusion, we did not present that rate. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I'll just make brief mention about ongoing investigation to look at health effects after COVID-19 or myocarditis after COVID-19 vaccination. Next slide, please. So CDC is currently engaged in enhanced surveillance, uh, looking at longer-term myocarditis outcomes after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Um, so what we're doing is looking at uh, longer-term functional status and clinical outcomes among persons less than 29 years of age who, um, again, through provider interview or medical record review, were determined to meet case definition. Um, and this sort of surveillance is a two-component survey that will be administered to persons who, uh, that I just described who are at least 90 days out from the onset of their symptoms of myocarditis. Um, this two-component survey includes a patient survey that is meant to ascertain the functional status, the clinical symptoms, quality of life, and need for medication or other treatment um, for their myocarditis. And then there is a healthcare provider component um, to be administered to a healthcare professional, such as a cardiologist, that is meant to gather data on the patient's cardiac health and functional status. With regard to um, timeline, data collection began in August of 2021 and will continue through November of 2021. Next slide, please. So where we are at the moment is that as of August 18th, VAERS had received 742 reports of myocarditis or myopericarditis after COVID-19 vaccination that met case definition um, based upon provider interview or medical record review. And of those 742 reports, there were 253 patients who uh, met the minimum 90 days um, post myocarditis diagnosis and are eligible for interview. Um, so that data collection is currently underway and we can provide updates um, as they occur. Next slide, please. So just to briefly sum up, next slide, please. Um, to date, as of August 18th, VAERS had received 2,574 reports of myopericarditis or pericarditis. The epidemiology of myopericarditis after COVID-19 vaccination remains consistent with what's been reported in previous updates, primarily being seen among younger males after dose 2 of mRNA vaccine. 
vaccination with symptom onset clustering within several days of vaccination. Limited follow-up information does suggest that most patients, uh, here about 77%, recovered from their symptoms at time of report or follow-up, with a little bit of mention about observed versus expected analysis among males, counts of observed exceeded estimated expected accounts in age groups through age 49 years, among females, counts of observed versus estimated expected counts, uh, or I'm sorry, Est uh, observed counts exceeded estimated expected counts on ages through 29 years of age among women. Um, and then there's brief mention about enhanced surveillance for myopericarditis, sorry, myopericarditis, that does include myopericarditis outcomes after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination in bears, and that project is ongoing. Next slide, please. So just a brief thank you to the many people who made this data possible, including our state and local partners. Next slide, please. And that's what I came prepared to discuss today. I appreciate your time, and back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sue. Uh, for our committee members, I would like to open up this presentation for questions. Um, we will uh, have a summary of the discussion and the interpretation by VAST on both the VAERS and VSD presentation. But since there is so much data in each of these presentations, I want to make sure we have the opportunity to pause and ask questions. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Kathy Paling first. Hey, thank you, Dr. Sue, for um, a very informative presentation. One of the questions I want to ask, in VAERS, I understand it is self-reported, so we're dealing with numerator data. Do we have a sense on the race ethnicity, and is there a difference from what you can tell in this signal? Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, as far as race ethnicity data go, um, I'm glad you recognize that this is passive surveillance, and so the completion of data is, um, you, know, you do want to be careful about interpreting this data. Um, roughly about half of reports uh, were among, among those reports with race or ethnicity data, roughly about half of reports were among white non-Hispanic persons. Um, the second largest proportion were those who reported no uh, race or ethnicity data. So um, now, uh, I don't believe we stratified that by manufacturer or dose number. We could take a look and get back to that if, if you're really interested in those data. But again, I would um, caveat uh, some uh, con any conclusions you might draw from those data. Thank you. Dr. Chen? Uh, thank you, Dr. Su, for that uh, summary of the safety information from VAERS. Uh, this is a question for you or, or perhaps for Grace, but uh, were there data uh, or are there data to be presented today from the VSAFE mechanism? And uh, perhaps this is part of your vast uh, assessment summary, uh, Grace, but uh, again, I was wondering if this continues to be a very valuable mechanism for us to evaluate the safety of these vaccines. Um. John, would you like to address that first? Or I don't know if uh, Dr. Shimabukuro is on the line, and I'm happy to take it if, um, from the vast perspective, if you like. Hi, this uh, is Doctor. Uh, can you hear me? This is this is Tom. Yes. Can you hear me? Tom, we can hear um, you. So, I v VSafe is still um, quite active and is and is enrolling um, patients, and in fact, is available for for a third dose um, to be monitoring third dose. Um, VSafe at in the in the initial um, week following immunization, VSafe um, asks a very specific set of questions, largely on local and systemic reactogenicity, and then also on um, adverse health impact events such as um, ability to do work, um, ability to perform normal daily activities, and whether the patient um, received received healthcare from a healthcare professional. Um, but it, it doesn't specifically ask questions about myocarditis. Um, if, if an individual does report seeking uh, healthcare, which presumably someone with myocarditis would, that then we would follow up in VAERS to con directly contact that patient and take a, and, and take a VAERS report. So um, VSAFE, I would say, facilitates the collection of information 
on um, more clinically um, important or medically important adverse events, and that's done through VARES, but it doesn't directly monitor for myocarditis. Thank you. And um, I'll just chime in that from the uh, vast perspective, you know, it has been incredibly helpful to have be safe online, um, particularly uh, in December and January as we were launching the vaccination program and to also to just have the opportunity for individuals to be able to contribute to vaccine safety. And so we are uh, grateful to all the be safe participants. Um, it has been more recently uh, a focus of attention on very specific groups of individuals, such as uh, pregnant women, uh, as we uh, approved the teen vaccines, we wanted to make sure that we had the ability to capture additional data on young kids and BeSafe has been um, extremely helpful in that, um, in that manner uh, and additional doses of vaccines. So I think that at this point, um, some of the major sort of um, reactogenicity issues are well established um, and we appreciate the opportunity to continue to leverage the BeSafe system and for our BeSafe colleagues to <laughs> Um, continue to do their um, monitoring to support, again, uh, overall vaccine safety surveillance as the vaccination program evolves over time. Um, I will turn it over to Dr. Brooks. For yeah. Dr. Brooks. Thank you, Dr. Lee, and thank you, Dr. Seuss, for your presentation. It is noted that theirs is self-reporting or provider reporting, kind of passive. Um, what is the potential for under-reporting? For example, can we extrapolate out based on prior information from VAERS and other vaccines uh, if there is, in fact, more myocarditis actually happening that is just not coming uh, to VAERS? Dr. Sue, are you on the line? I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> can you hear me now? We can, thank you. Okay. Sure. So uh, thanks for that question, Dr. Brooks. Um, I would point to previous uh, analyses, which have um, now admittedly these were for selected conditions like GBS and anaphylaxis, but previous reports have demonstrated that VARES does capture a substantial proportion of adverse events out there. With specific regard to myocarditis, my recollection is that the reporting rates that we're seeing um, are are roughly comparable to what has been seen in other surveillance systems like uh, the vaccine safety data link. So you know, I do anticipate there might be some underreporting. That being said, I think that in the case of myocarditis, the data are do capture a pretty good proportion of what's out there. I won't say complete capture, but uh, you know, I think in terms of what we're capturing, we're getting a good number. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. And Dr. Freihofer, we'll take your last question. Sandra Freihofer, American Medical Association. Dr. Sue, thank you for that excellent um, presentation because I get asked a lot of questions about myocarditis. I just wanted to clarify uh, a couple of questions. So you're on slide four, you talk about a, there are 2574 reports. Are those verified reports or this, are, are those just people, anyone sending in a report? Um, so that 2,574 includes the, those reports for which we've been able to um, been able to uh, verify by provider interview or chart review um, that they meet case definition. But it also includes a good number of reports that were identified by automated computer search as well. So it's kind of a mix of the two. So those are real reports then. Um, so on slide 11. You um, that refers to the um, to you said that there's 742 that made the, met the case definition. What does the 494 under review mean? That means those reports for which we're still trying to obtain medical records or still trying to um, contact the provider involved, um, so that we can apply the same level of um, stringency as we did the 742 that met case definition. And then on slide 16. The, um, the 742 that you're re that you're doing the enhanced surveillance, those are all uh, individuals under 29 years old. Yes, ma'am. And Thank those you. that, and I'll just elaborate. Those 742 have been verified by provider interview or medical record review to meet the case definition. This is really helpful and very reassuring that the patient seems to be doing well so far. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sue, for your uh, presentation. Um, we will move on to Dr. Uh, Nikki Klein for the VSD. 
And good morning or afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, today, I'll be focusing, uh, talking about the vaccine safety data link data, but I'm focusing on myocarditis and anaphylaxis mainly. Next slide, please. So the vaccine safety data link it has, was established in 1990, and it's a collaborative project between CDC and nine integrated healthcare delivery systems throughout the United States, and it includes data on over 12 million uh, members of these healthcare institutions. Next slide. So the aims of the overall aims of the VSD rapid cycle analysis, as we call it, are to monitor the safety of COVID-19 vaccines weekly using pre-specified outcomes of interest among VSD members and to describe the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines over time among eligible VSD members overall administrated by age, site, race, and ethnicity. We began surveillance in December 2020. Next slide, please. Now, these are the list of the 23 outcomes that we are monitoring, and you can see the details. I won't go through this busy slide, but there's a lot of details in here in case you're um, interested in looking further at what the um, outcomes and how they're treated and the different uh, risk intervals and whether or not they were automatically chart reviewed. Next slide, please. So here is the vaccine uptake in the VSD through August 21st. Next slide. Uh, you can see that there's been uh, more than 13.3 million doses administered to VSD members, and to date, 66.5% of the age-eligible VSD population is fully vaccinated. Next slide. Now, as you've, I've shown this before, this is updated data. You, as you can see that um, most vaccines given in the VSD are mRNA vaccines, but today I will be focusing uh, really only on the mRNA vaccines that you can see listed here, and it's divided a little bit more Pfizer than Moderna, but both still many doses of both these vaccines. Next slide. So here's the primary analysis, and again, this is analysis through August 21st, 2021. Next slide. And I'm going to spend a few minutes actually spending, um, describing analysis um, a, with a little bit of um, some information. So for an analytic strategy for our primary analysis, for what we call our rapid cycle analysis. So for the primary analysis, the number of outcomes observed in the risk interval, which, which in the presented data will be one to 21 days, after COVID-19 vaccinations were compared to the number expected. Now the number expected was derived from what we're calling the vaccinated concurrent comparators who were in a comparison interval, and again, that's days 22 to 42 after COVID-19 vaccination. So on each day that an outcome occurred, and this is important, so on each day that an outcome occurred, vaccinees who were in their risk interval were compared with similar vaccinees who were concurrently in their comparison interval. All the comparisons were adjusted for age group, sex, race, ethnicity, VSD site, as well as calendar date. Uh, now that's a little bit hard to envision, so next slide. So here is an example of an outcome. Since we're focusing mainly on myocarditis today, we've used myocarditis as the example, but what, I, what you see here in this slide would apply to any outcome in our analysis. But so this here shows a vaccine with myocarditis and a risk interval and the concurrent comparators. So on each calendar day, as I mentioned, that an outcome occurred in a vaccine, and we'll call that June 3rd, for example. We compared a vaccine in their risk interval, and by that we mean their one to 21 days after vaccination with a similar vaccine in their comparison interval on day 22 to 42. Now the, first, the upper picture shows the, uh, the person right there with the little red heart, and that's the person who had myocarditis on June 3rd. That person was vaccinated on May 30th, and they're, so therefore they're in their one to 21 day risk interval, post-vaccination risk interval. Now that person was compared on, the, on June 3rd, a person who was on June 3rd in their comparison interval 22 to 42 days after vaccination, because you can see in the lower picture that that person was vaccinated on May 3rd. So they are now in the comparison interval. 
And so that person was, well, we, what we mean by that person being similar was that they were in the same age group and of the same sex, race, and at the same VSD site. So these are the comparisons that you'll see in all the analysis in the, um, today's uh, uh, presentation. Next slide. So this, uh, these are the analysis that we monitor weekly. And I've, I've bolded, we've bolded myocarditis, pericarditis, because that's really the feature that we're really focusing on today. But it's not meant to imply anything because um, none of the outcomes has signaled. And by signal, we mean a one-sided p-value being less than 0 0.0048. And none of the outcomes listed on this table has signaled. And you can see that um, by the rate ratios and the one side of p-values in the column. So um, next slide. Uh, just a note that that last slide was all ages combined. So that was among all ages there's been no signals. However, we're focusing on the younger population of myocarditis, pericarditis. And here are the chart review summary. So we have, pre we are chart review all cases of myocarditis and pericarditis identified among 12 to 39 year olds after mRNA vaccine. And this is chart review data through August 21st. Next slide. So for our chart review cases through August 21st, we have completed 100 out of 102 cases of two pending, again, among 12 to 39 year olds. And these are cases that we identified during the one to 98 days post-vaccination. Um, all initial chart review is followed by adjudication by the infectious disease clinician and or cardiologist. And these adjudications confirm in, that the cases were incident following vaccinations. They're confirmed based on CDC definitions and evaluate the level of certainty for myocarditis. Now, adjudication confirms 78 out of 100 or 78 percent of post vaccination myocarditis pericarditis cases and 56 confirmed cases among 12 to 39 year olds with the onset during the zero to 21 days after dose one or two. And those are the cases that we'll really be focusing on today. The next slide. Next slide. So here are the descriptive characteristics of the confirmed myocarditis, pericarditis, zero to 21 days after any dose by age group. Um, what you can see here, you can see for the race, um, approximately half, especially for the younger individuals, were white, um, and then the next largest ethnic group was um, noted to be Hispanic. Um, for the for the diagnosis, um, most of the 12 to 17 year olds were acute myocarditis or mild pericarditis. Um, there was a little more evenly divided amongst the 30 to 39 year olds with regard to the diagnosis. Next slide. So these are the symptoms of diagnostic testing by age group. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the, both the 12 to 17 year olds and the 18 to 29 year olds had abnormal troponin levels. Uh, only about half the 30 to 39 year olds had abnormal troponins. And um, with regard to the abnormal findings on an echocardiogram, um, just under half or one third to one under one half had abnormal echocardiograms in the 12 to 17 year olds and 18 to 29 year olds, although 82% um, of the 30 to 39 year olds did have abnormal echoes. Next slide. Um, regard to level of care and discharge status, um, you can see that the younger individuals were all treated in an emergency department, hospitalized or in the ICU. Um, there were no ICU cases in the 18 to 39 year olds. Um, the length of stay was a little bit longer for the 12 to 17 year olds, um, ranging up to two days mostly, um, with, and it was a little bit shorter for the older 30 to 39 year olds, more in the one, zero to one day range, and about uh, evenly divided amongst the 18 to 29 year olds. Next slide. So these are the, well, the next slides are going to show the analyses of confirmed myocarditis, pericarditis after mRNA vaccines, again, only under 12, among 12 to 39 year olds. And these are the data through 821. Now, again, these, this is the analysis for the primary concurrent comparators, which I showed you the slide, the graph earlier. Next slide. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I, I got ahead of myself. So these are the, well, this is temporal scan statistics. This is the clustering of the cases of the confirmed, chart confirmed cases among the 12 to 39 year olds after either dose. And what you can see is that they significantly, and that's statistically significantly, cluster during the first week after vaccination. And so, because although um, we've been looking at the zero to 21 days, and I will show you the analysis next, the zero to 21 days, we will also be presenting data for the zero to seven days because of this temporal clustering, which we do see. Next slide. Okay, so this is a confirmed myocarditis, pericarditis in the zero to 21 day risk interval among the 12 to 39 year olds. Again, this is compared with the outcome events in the vaccinated concurrent comparators, um, as, as I showed you in the earlier graph. And what you see is after both mRNA vaccines and after both doses, you can see an elevated rate ratio um, ranging from uh, it was over five and a half after both doses and a little bit higher after dose two of 8.3 adjusted rate ratio. These are uh, statistically significant, as you can see by the confidence intervals. And when we look by product and by dose, what you can see is that after dose on both doses for both Pfizer and Moderna, as well as dose two for both Pfizer and Moderna, you see that there is, there's an elevated rate ratio after Pfizer that's statistically significant. Now for Moderna, we had zero cases in the comparison interval, so we actually can't estimate what the adjuster rate ratio is, but it's highly statistically significant. And we know that because the lower bound of the confidence interval for both the both dose analysis and the dose two analysis after Moderna, the lower bound is 3.3 and 3.79, which is well above one. So for what we see here is that for both products um, combined and separately, we are seeing elevated rate ratios um, of myocarditis in the zero to 21 days. Next slide. Now, when we go to the zero to seven day risk interval, again, in the same 12 to 39 year olds, similar slide, you can see that um, the same pattern, pattern holds, although the numbers are actually quite a bit larger. You see after both doses, we see a rate ratio of over 15.5. Um, that's um, after dose two for both doses combined is 23.8. And again, you see after both dose two of Pfizer, you see that it's again, almost an adjusted rate ratio of 22.9. And again, from the Darna, while we don't have an estimate, you can see the lower bound of confidence interval after both doses and dose two is well above nine. So these are all highly statistically significant. Next slide. I know there's interest in looking at just the 18 to 39 year olds. So this is in the zero to seven day risk interval among 18 to 39. So a little bit older group. And here, because we looked at this because uh, both these products are used and 18 year olds. Um, so when we look at just this smaller subgroup, we again see that there's an elevated rate ratio of over 10 for both doses and over nearly 13.8 after both doses combined. And we see the same pattern for, um, by product specific and dose specific analyses, again, with the Moderna, again, being highly statistically significant um, with the lower bound of confidence intervals being above nine. Next slide. Now, um, finally, we just I want, want to show that what the confirmed myocarditis, pericarditis are among. This is just the 12 to 17 year olds. And again, so this would just be Pfizer only, since it's only authorized in this age group. And this is in both the zero to seven and zero to 21 risk day risk interval. Now, here in this case, because we also have zero events in the comparison interval, we have the same, again, we don't, we are not unable to estimate the rate ratio, but again, we see the lower bound of confidence interval, very similar pattern, highly statistically significant for um, both the zero to 21 and the zero to seven day risk intervals after both doses and dose two. Next slide. Now, we have been doing, since we've been, since it's an um, emerging concern has, has evolved over time, we have actually set up to do and start and started a three month follow up on these myopericarditis cases in terms of chart review. So as of August 27th, uh, chart reviews have been completed for 39, excuse me, 29 of 34 cases that have been time eligible for three month follow up review, meaning that there's been at least three months have, have, have passed since their initial event. So of these 29, 24 had at least one follow-up visit, at least seven days since the initial encounter. 
So these 24 cases were reviewed to obtain information regarding symptoms and diagnostic evaluations of the most recent follow-up visit and the recovery status for ongoing symptoms, medications, and exercise restrictions. Next slide. So this is the um, cases at the follow-up chart review, three-month follow-up time. And these were cases, again, with at least one follow-up visit since initial. And these are the 24 cases that I referred to earlier. So what you can see is that um, in the first row in, in the box, you can see that actually um, many of them had followed it as well before the three month time period, uh, just under two months period, 53 days for the 12 to 17 year olds, and then that 31 days for the 18 to 29 year olds, and then a little bit longer period, uh, closer to the three month period for 30 to 39 year olds. And you can see that um, we had Again, the small numbers are small, so it's hard to draw any conclusions. So there's not that many cases that we see here, especially for the very young groups, youngest ages, but that actually um, zero of the 12 to 17 year olds actually had a visit at three months after the initial counter. Their visits were much earlier and equally um, also smaller numbers for the um, older age groups. Um, and then uh, just the small numbers are hard to live a hard to interpret, but you can see that most cases in the row underneath had no new or worsening symptoms noted. So six, two of the three for the younger individuals, and then eight of 11 um, for the 18 to 29, and um, eight of the 10 for the 30 to 39 year olds. And of note, those three of those, these three cases were three of those ICU cases for the 12 to 17 year olds who were in the ICU originally. Next slide. Now, in terms of the current status of the most recent follow up visit for these same cases, you can see that, um, again, with the small numbers, that, that there is a range of um, the youngest individuals which all still want to exercise the physical activity restrictions, um, much less so for the older individuals. And they, um, they also, most of the older individuals were reported, uh, at least for the 12 to 8, excuse me, the 18 to 29 year olds, 80, 73% were unrecovered. Um, and the 30 and 39 year olds were a little bit more um, ranged in terms of what they reported with the most recent follow -up. Next slide. So I'm just going to briefly turn to the anaphylaxis chart review summary. These are updates through 7, uh, July 31st. Next slide. So this is a busy slide, but um, just going to highlight that these were chart reviews that were completed for 213 out of the 216 cases through July 31st, and that 31% of the cases were confirmed as post-vaccination anaphylaxis with a day zero to one emergency, emergency department visit. Uh, what you can see and highlighted in the box is that both after Pfizer and Moderna, their, the rates of anaphylaxis are for five or five per five confirmed cases per million doses. Moderna is 4.9 cases per million doses, so very, very similar. Um, we also noted that there are uh, three cases after Janssen, and we haven't used that much Janssen vaccine, um, and that the rate is 7.6, although I will very much urge caution since it's only three cases. Um, so we will keep an eye on that, but we are not using that much Janssen, so I, um, we'll have to see if we are able to refine those estimates or not, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on it as we identify cases. But these have been consistent with what we've been seeing for several months now in the um, VSD in terms of the rates after mRNA vaccines for anaphylaxis. Next slide. So to summarize, in the VSD, the rate of anaphylaxis after mRNA vaccines has been approximately five, five confirmed cases per million doses, and that has been re remained um, in that range for the last quite a few months now. Um, we have had no signals for myocarditis, pericarditis, or for any other outcome in the 21 days after both mRNA vaccine doses and the overall VSD population, including all ages greater than 12. However, in the subgroup age 12 to 39 years, the rate ratio for myocarditis, pericarditis was elevated after both Pfizer and Moderna during days zero to 21 after vaccination, and especially during days zero to seven. And subgroup analyses, both mRNA vaccines were associated with myocarditis, pericarditis in persons aged 12 to 39 years. Fine. Uh, next slide. 
So I'd just like to acknowledge um, the team at Kaiser Permanente in Northern California who have been working really hard, as well as the Marshfield Group and uh, folks at the CBC office, and of course all the VSC sites who have um, just been doing you know, ongoing chart reviews and lots of work. And in particular, I'd like to really point out uh, Christian Goddard in Northern California, who's been leading these myocarditis chart reviews and really doing a great job. Um, and then also particularly thanks to Tom Boyce and Matt Oyster at the CDC for doing the adjudication on the myocarditis cases. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Klein. And this presentation is now open for questions. Again, because uh, it was outstanding and lots of data, so it's a lot to process. <laughs> Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. Um, so, and thank you for the presentation, which was uh, really, um, thank you, you know, very enlightening. But I just had a question. Um, you know, COVID infection among athletes has been associated with uh, substantial cardiac involvement. And I was wondering if you had gathered any information on the myocarditis, myocarditis um, in these young individuals if they were athletes or any specific sports. Thank you. Uh, you're talking about the, our cases after vaccination? Yes. Let me exactly. be clear. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Um, I don't believe we are capturing information in terms of that aspect. Um, I, we have been monitoring whether they have um, had a history of COVID. Um, and let me just double check that. I believe that um, none of the young individuals had a history of COVID, and one had a history of myopericarditis um, in terms of the 12 to 17 year olds. Yeah, but um, my question, I guess, relates more um, with COVID infection in yet in athletes, young athletes, has been associated with significant cardiac involvement. If these individuals who did not have prior COVID, who had um, myocarditis after COVID vaccination, was there any propensity for, um, for the occurring among young athletes and or other type of um, specific sports? Right. Now, it's an interesting question, but we are not capturing information, as, as far as I'm aware, on um, athletic status of um, myocarditis cases after COVID vaccine. Thank you. We'll move on to Dr. Sarah Long. Uh, thank you, Grace. Um, comments and um, maybe then a question. Uh, the comment is that clinicians know that this is a unique syndrome. This is not typical myopericarditis, and it's not so in a very good way, in that the presentation is abrupt onset of chest pain and the recovery is very rapid. So for 80% of these, these are not uh, anything that we would consider as uh, likely to be a traditional uh, myo or pericarditis. Um, so I, I, I don't, I, you know, I know you like to look at things in the prior study, expected versus uh, non unexpected or, or in excess. This is unique. This is as unique as cerebral venous thrombosis and thrombocytopenia was unique. And in that one, kind of in a bad way, it was worse than regular venous thrombosis. So th that's a concern. Now, for this one, I um, just uh, seeing many of these cases as they come through me as an associate editor of a journal, I am querying very carefully the cardiologists and the reviewers and everybody about the cases. I'm wondering about those cases that uh, you're comparing in the first 21 days with after the 21 days. Are those cases after the 21 days the same syndrome, chest pain, epi um, um, myocardials or sub pericardial myocarditis, uh, very little dysfunction, very rapid uh, uh, response resolution. So are those in the second month even cases that we would as clinicians say, yes, this is that unique association with the vaccine. 
And then a third, so that's the little question. Have you looked at those cases you're comparing these with in the second month to see it's even the same disease? And then the second thing would be um, after the first dose, I'm seeing in the case series that uh, has come across my a desk as an editor, uh, that there's much more variation in the occurrence of, uh, of the time of onset. So some of them are rapid and some of them are delayed. And in one case, uh, there was evidence that the patient had actually had coronavirus infection, then got pericarditis 20 days after the first dose, and then got it again right after the second dose, um, that the, some of those uh, may be enlightened by very careful serologic tests that are done. So do you, so I guess my short question is, um, do you, have you looked at the actual clinical presentations of those that you're comparing risk time and non-risk time to see that they're really similar patients? Well, just to clarify, again, we chart reviewed and adjudicated by um, a cardiologist or infectious disease physician all cases that occurred in the 98 days after vaccination, not just the 21 days. Those are I presented the 21 days to feature that here, but we actually chart reviewed and confirmed all of those cases in the 98 days. I, I, in terms of whether there's some subtle difference that um, may have been available in the chart between the comparison cases versus the risk cases. I can't really speak to that, um, whether, I don't know if there's anyone on the call who was available who could speak, who did adjudicate. Um, but I, we did treat them all the same. All the cases have been treated the same and adjudicated the same way because they, we did them all in the same way. Um, with regard to your second question, the we in terms of what happens after dose one, the timing of dose one at versus dose two. I mean, most of our case we do have um, most of our cases after dose two, although we are seeing we do see cases after dose one. We have seen significant clustering in the first week after back of after vaccination after both doses and. Um, again, whether that's a different entity, all the cases and risk and comparison cases have been treated the same. So I can't speak to whether there's a difference between a case three weeks after vaccination versus one week after vaccination. But in our analysis, in which we looked at both one to zero to 21 days and zero to seven days, we are seeing an elevated risk um, after both doses in the zero to seven days um, that they really do cluster close to vaccination. I hope I've answered your question. Thank, thank you, Dr. Long and Dr. Klein. Um, I'm gonna call on Dr. Fryhofer and then we'll move on to the next session. But there will be additional time for questions um, after the next presentation. Dr. Um, Fryhofer? Yeah, Sandra Fryhofer, American Medical Association. I have a question about the anaphylaxis. Um, you said the rate is about five cases per million doses. How does this compare to other vaccines? And have there been, has anyone died from anaphylaxis from um, COVID vaccine? Um, so with regard to the rates, um, what's, it's, we've usually seen that the rates after flu vaccine and other vaccines are in the one to two per million range. So this is a little higher than what we have traditionally seen for many other vaccines. Um, this is consistent, though, with what we've seen for the last several months, and it is relatively consistent with what it was reported to VAERS. VAERS is a little bit lower, but in the same two to four to five range from VAERS as well, um, per, per million, cases per million. Um, now, in terms of whether anyone has died, I don't believe anyone died in, our, in the VSD after anaphylaxis from COVID vaccine. Um, and it looks like the that the um, the symptoms are showing up with that 15 to 20, the 30 um, range, which is the amount of time that patients are supposed to be observed. So that sort of reinforces that um, that recommendation. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Klein. Um, and with that, we'll move on to the next presentation. I will just say also that the um, you know risk mitigation strategies in place are uh, meant to ensure that we can safely provide vaccines to the population. 
you're able to pull up the vast presentation. Thank you. Um, I am presenting on behalf of the entire work group and my co-lead, Dr. Bob Hopkins, uh, who is the chair of NVAC. Next slide. The COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Technical Work Group, which we call VAST for short, has the four objectives below uh, to review, evaluate, and interpret post-authorization or approval vaccine safety data for COVID-19 vaccines, to serve as a central hub for technical subject matter expertise from the federal agencies, advise on analyses, interpretation, and data presentation, and then to provide updates to the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Work Group and the ACIP on COVID-19 vaccine safety. Next slide. Since December 21st, 2020, so exactly one week after the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine was administered in the U.S., uh, VAST has had 32 independent meetings to review vaccine safety data and eight joint meetings with the COVID-19 vaccines work group focused on safety. Um, in addition, apologies, the uh, formatting always goes off, <laughs> has shared its assessment nine times since the start of the pandemic at ACIP meetings or through updates on the VAST Web page. Next slide. Our federal agencies have partnered closely with VAST to provide updates on COVID-19 vaccine safety surveillance activities in real time. And we want to recognize the incredible work by our safety teams at the CDC, the FDA, Department of Defense, Veterans Administration, and Indian Health Services, along with all of their safety investigators supporting this all of government effort. Next slide. We have previously presented U.S. data on the risk of anaphylaxis and myocarditis following mRNA COVID-19 vaccines and uh, TTS and uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome following the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. In addition, VAST continues to conduct prospective surveillance on a long list of pre-specified adverse events of special interest. And we also meet with uh, OB experts to review safety data on COVID-19 vaccination of pregnant individuals. And of note, we hope to provide an update uh, to the entire ACIP on this topic of maternal immunization in an upcoming meeting. These safety data are then incorporated into our decision-making processes. Um, as will be presented by our colleagues later today, we continue to update our benefit risk assessments with new and emerging data. We work with our CDC colleagues and liaison representatives around the virtual table on clinical considerations to ensure that we support informed discussions about the benefits and risks of available vaccines, as well as clinical guidance to support early detection and appropriate management. And more recently, VAST has provided guidance for the use of post-approval safety data in GRADE, given the large amount of accumulated safety data observed in over 200 million individuals in the U.S who have received over 368 million COVID-19 vaccine doses. Next slide. VAST continues to review data on um, myocarditis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and TTS from all of our federal agencies. And you've heard updates today from two of our systems. We've also been fortunate to have the opportunity to review data previously um, from uh, countries such as Israel and Canada. Uh, though we recognize that those data are continuously changing and being updated. And so, um, you know, we appreciate that collaboration and transparency. And we are also fortunate to have the chair of WHO's Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety on our work group as well. Next slide. Now turning to anaphylaxis following mRNA vaccines. Um, anaphylaxis uh, following COVID-19 vaccines was identified first in December 2020. Um, safety data and VAST assessment were presented at the January and March 2021 ACIP meetings, with the references below to the slide decks. And CDC and FDA recommended risk mitigation strategies at that time, which continue to be in place, including screening for risk prior to vaccination, monitoring for symptoms post-vaccination, early recognition and management of anaphylaxis on site, and provider and patient education by CDC and um, partners, key partners. Next slide. In addition to sharing these data at our open ACIP meetings, our CDC colleagues have also published these data to ensure um, providers will remain updated and the public. 
Next slide. And tools to support safe administration of COVID-19 vaccines were shared widely and continue to be used in our vaccination clinics. Next slide. Uh, VAERS initially presented data on the rate of anaphylaxis early in the vaccination program. It was approximately 11.1 .1 per million doses administered for Pfizer-BioNTech um, in the early week of vaccination and 2.5 per million doses administered for Moderna vaccine, again, in the very early weeks of the vaccination program. More recent data from the VSG among persons 12 and older have demonstrated that the rates are similar uh, to each other at about five per million uh, following Pfizer um, doses administered and about 4.9 per million from Moderna doses administered. Um, similar to earlier findings, a majority of these cases seem to occur in females and after the first dose. And vast assessment is that there is no substantial change in the benefit risk balance uh, with risk mitigation strategies in place. Next slide. VAST has also been closely following myocarditis following mRNA vaccines. Um, myocarditis uh, following COVID-19 vaccines was first identified in May of 2021. CDC issued clinical guidance for myocarditis, pericarditis, pericarditis following mRNA vaccines in May of 2021. Data were presented at the uh, Vaccines and Related Biologics Products Advisory Committee, uh, which is the uh, Federal Advisory Committee to the FDA on June 10th. And data on myocarditis and our VAST assessment were also presented at the ACIP meeting on June 23rd, and a MMWR report was published. Um, EUA fact sheets were revised with a warning added on June 25th. And then with the FDA approval of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine on August 23rd, uh, there is additional information on myocarditis, pericarditis that was included in the package insert. Next slide. Um, and uh, MMWR publications summarizing ACIP's deliberations on myocarditis were published and clinical considerations specific to myocarditis and pericarditis uh, were also um, put on the CDC website to guide uh, clinicians and uh, vaccinators. Next slide. Um, Dr. Sue and Dr. Klein updated us today uh, with very granular information on rates of myocarditis. I'm just highlighting the zero to seven day risk interval here. Um, you'll see VAERS on the left, and these numbers reflect the reporting rate per million doses administered after each dose of either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine and broken down by age group. And I'm sorry, those boxes got um, adjusted upwards. Um, and in DSD on the right, you'll see the excess number of cases per million doses administered based on chart confirmed data. You can see that the rates appear fairly similar in the two systems, despite different methods being used. The rates are higher following dose two of vaccine versus dose one. Um, and what I don't show here, but has been shown on prior slides is the uh, male predominance. And the VAERS data demonstrates the heterogeneity seen by age with younger individuals having higher rates. Next slide. Um, VAST has been very interested in having a better understanding of the clinical course of these individuals. Uh, VAERS has reviewed, um, I, these numbers are shifting daily because I will just tell you this is real-time information. So. Um, I believe that at the time that I drafted these slides, there were 845 cases reviewed for individuals less than 30 years of age. Of those cases, approximately 88% of the reviewed cases met CDC case definition. 77% were known to have recovered from symptoms at the time of the VAERS report. Uh, VSD um, has chart reviewed 98 cases among individuals 12 to 39 years of age. Again, at the time I drafted these last slides, 56% um, of cases met chart confirmation criteria for myocarditis within zero to 21 days of vaccination. 100% had chest pain or pressure or discomfort. And elevated 
melatonin, abnormal EKG findings, and abnormal MRI were common, um, although there were some uh, 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 small differences noted uh, per Dr. Klein's presentation uh, by age group. 76% um, were discharged within zero to two days, and I echo Dr. Long's sentiments that this is very different than the typical cases of my viral myocarditis we see clinically in the hospital, and 100% were discharged to home. Next slide. So VAST has discussed uh, all of the data that have been available to date, uh, and we agree that the data suggest an association of myocarditis with mRNA vaccination in adolescents and young adults. Uh, further data are being compiled to understand potential risk factors, optimal management strategies, and long-term outcomes. Um, and we really appreciate the CISA VAERS collaboration uh, focused on this long-term follow-up data, including the patient survey on functional status, clinical symptoms, quality of life, and any ongoing need for medication or treatment and the provider survey on cardiac health and functional status. Next slide. Uh, the FDA fully licensed the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for those 16 years and older on August 23rd, 2021. Next slide. Able to move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and as part of this approval, the FDA issued um, post-marketing requirements for the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 mRNA vaccine specific, specifically related to myocarditis, including a non-interventional post-approval safety study to evaluate the occurrence of myocarditis and pericarditis in the U.S., a post-conditional approval active surveillance study to evaluate occurrence of myocarditis and pericarditis in Europe, with a substudy to describe the natural history of myocarditis and pericarditis, a prospective cohort study of um, at least five years in duration for potential long-term sequelae of myocarditis after vaccination in collaboration with the Pediatric Heart Network, and substudies of clinical trials to prospectively assess the incidence of subclinical myocarditis following second dose in a subset of participants aged five to 15 years and 16 to 30 years. Next slide. I also wanted to highlight a study published earlier this week, um, approximately five days ago, on the safety of the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine in Israel. Uh, the team, this team evaluated the risk of adverse events, such as myocarditis, in a 42-day window after vaccination and in a 42-day window after COVID-19 infection. This figure shows the risk ratio on a log scale for adverse events following vaccination in blue, and it's on the left of each of the smaller um, squares, and following COVID-19 infection in orange on the right side of the squares. Above the dotted line means there's an elevated risk and below the dotted line means it's protective. So highlighting the example of myocarditis, which is shown in the left lower corner, you can see that there is a 3.2 fold risk of myocarditis after vaccination versus an 18.3-fold risk of myocarditis after COVID-19 infection. Um, this translates to a risk difference of 2.7 per 100,000 persons vaccinated versus 11 per 100,000 persons infected. Um, you can also see that adverse events such as acute kidney injury, uh, deep venous thrombosis, intracranial hemorrhage, arrhythmia, myocardial infarction, and pulmonary embolism are substantially higher after SARS-CoV-2 infection. And while certain adverse events such as lymphadenopathy are more common in vaccinated individuals, vaccines also appear to have a protective effect against acute kidney injury and intracranial hemorrhage in this data, perhaps through the prevention of COVID-19 infection. Next slide. In sum, VAST will continue to ensure the review of near real-time uh, safety data in the U.S. I want to emphasize that this is a collaboration across our U.S. federal agencies and that this collaboration has been essential for a successful vaccination program. We will also continue to collaborate with global vaccine safety colleagues on key issues that impact benefit risk balance, including a focus on myocarditis and booster doses, um, and that VAST is committed to providing updates to the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines workgroup and the ACIP at future meetings. 
Next slide. And with that, I will thank our vast work group members, um, our CDC co-leads, uh, Lori Markowitz and Melinda Wharton, um, for steering us <laughs> boldly through the last, uh, has it, um, it feels like it's been over a year, um, ex officio and liaison representatives um, and our colleague, uh, colleagues at CDC who have been supporting us throughout. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to open this presentation for any questions, if there's any clarifying questions, or if there are other questions for the other vaccine safety uh, presenters. Dr. Chen. Great. Thanks so much for, for summarizing the, uh, the important deliberations of the VAST work group. And thank you for the VAST work group's uh, work as well. Um, so this question, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to answer. It's maybe a comment, but... Uh, you were able to look at the anaphylaxis risk, and I think that you made a bullet point statement of noting that uh, that there was maybe uh, more of these events following first dose, at least among women, and I think this was in relation to Moderna. I guess what I'm driving at is, is looking at anaphylaxis risk and whether or not there are trends uh, for it uh, following first dose rather than second dose. As we go into booster dose administrations, you know, uh, I, I'm thinking about our, our vaccine implementers and, and mass vaccination clinics that will be doing booster doses and reducing the burden of their work and the observation of 15 minutes. And, and if there is an evidence basis for re reducing or, or trying to develop better kind of clinical considerations and guidance for the observation period, or maybe even just the risk of anaphylaxis, after the third dose, perhaps, uh, or or what we've observed after two doses. So this is kind of continuing to look at the safety monitoring, which is so important, as you said, uh, as your final statement of, of looking at the context of all these vaccines and being able to talk about the value of these vaccines. But I'm just trying to think about this, this small piece of anaph anaphylaxis shortly after vaccination. Is there a way for us to... Um, Think about that risk as we go into booster doses. So that's kind of a comment, maybe a question. Thank you for the comment slash question. Um, actually, um, I'm going to respond, but I also wanted to see if there is somebody from the clinical considerations team at CDC who might be able to also comment afterwards. Um, uh, the data that has been previously published out of the vaccine safety surveillance systems has noted this female predominance. I think, you know, in my view, this is just my opinion, uh, you know, the first dose uh, uh, sort of association is, is probably more because uh, individuals who had some type of a, a significant reaction to the first dose didn't get a second dose. Um, it's just, uh, uh, it seems like that might be the, a reasonable reason. But I also recognize that there is emerging data that suggests that the second dose can be given safely depending on the type of reaction that the um, individual had. Um, and there are, you know, a wide range of uh, uh, reactions that are occurring. So uh, what I would say is I think it's a great question about um, uh, providing a little bit more granularity around additional doses of vaccine and uh, if we can uh, do anything else to mitigate risk and ensure uh, the safety while also providing uh, protection to those individuals. So um, Dr. Conor McNeil, is anyone from the CDC Clinical Considerations team able to comment? Sure. Thanks, Dr. Lee. Um, I just uh, wanted to, to concur with you, Dr. Lee, that this is something that the uh, that we will continue to bring data in, uh, to for consideration regarding anaphylaxis. Um, but you know, as a reminder, in our general recommendations for immunization, we do um, suggest that. Um, all individuals wait 15 minutes after vaccination or be observed in some capacity um, to prevent things or, or to to mitigate uh, things like anaphylaxis and um, really syncope as well. Um, this um, may be being implemented to a greater degree for these vaccines, and we can address um, whether or not um, emerging data suggests that that can be relaxed at all. But, but in general, um, our guidance is to um, wait uh, or observe a patient for 15 minutes after vaccination. Thank you. Dr. Paling? Yes, 
Dr. Lee, so I wanted to thank you and the entire team for this great presentation. This is really important. I too had a question about anaphylaxis and looking at it by dose in the future. The second part I wanted to ask is as we look up, um, to follow the um, safety in the future, is there an opportunity to break this down by race and ethnicity? We know there's disparities in uptake and taking those factors into account, and we'd like to see those in the future if that becomes available. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paley. And I really appreciate um, your comment about the need to continue to monitor any issues related to equity on both the efficacy and the safety front. And uh, we will uh, take that um, under advisement and make sure the data are being monitored. Uh, we'll just make sure that those data get presented in a future meeting. Thank you. Dr. Goldman. Thank you. First, great series of presentations. Really, really well done. It's more of a comment, especially about how important slide 18 was, especially in terms of messaging, uh, especially to the patients, that they realize your natural immunity versus vaccine immunity and the benefits of vaccine immunity that you don't have to get sick to become immune and just how serious COVID disease is and how much of these effects and side effects we do see from vaccines while there are not as significant as the disease itself. So I really think that is a truly important slide and something that we really need to hammer home the messaging on to uh, our patients and the vaccine hesitant that it is really preventing uh, serious illness and uh, tremendously bad outcomes uh, by using the vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. And with that, we will move on to uh, Dr. Hannah Rosenblum to present the benefit risk discussion. Dr. Rosenblum, are you there? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, thank Great. you. Next slide. Today's discussion will focus on the benefits and risks of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID 19 vaccine in individuals 16 to 29 years old. Next slide. Briefly, first, some background. Next slide. Since January 2020, there have been more than 38 million COVID-19 cases in the United States. Over the summer, indicated here as June through August 2021, there have been a rapid, in, a rapid rise in the number of cases throughout the country. Next slide. This rise has been reflected in increasing numbers of hospitalizations due to COVID-19. Here are two figures from CDC's data tracker that show new hospital admissions from August 2020 through the present. The yellow line on the left shows the trend for individuals aged 0 to 17 years, and the blue line on the right shows admissions in individuals aged 18 to 29. The y-axes aren't the same, but for both age groups, you can see that the peak in January 2021 was recently exceeded and continued to increase. Next slide. These two graphs show national forecasts for new COVID-19 cases on the left and new COVID-19 associated hospital admissions on the right for the upcoming four weeks from modeling groups working with CDC. Since both cases and hospitalizations are projected to continue to rise, we use these models to take the increases into account for the benefit risk analyses. Next slide. These figures show data from COVIDnet, which is a population-based surveillance system of hospitalized patients with COVID-19 in the United States. Severe COVID-19 outcomes for the three age groups that will be the focus of the rest of the presentation are shown here. Age 16 to 17 on the left, 18 to 24 in the middle, and 25 to 29 on the right. Among patients hospitalized from March 2020 through June 30th, 2021, Cumulative percentages for ICU admission are shown in the lightest shade, mechanical ventilation in the medium shade, and deaths in the darkest shade. For example, among 16 to 17 year olds, almost 25% of hospitalizations for COVID-19 resulted in ICU admission, and 5.6% of those hospitalized required mechanical ventilation, and 0.7% died in the hospital. Mean and median lengths of hospital stay are shown in blue above each age group. Each mean length of stay was about five days and median length of hospital stay ranged from two to three days. Next slide. 
This slide shows the trend of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC, cases in blue, overlaid on the number of COVID-19 cases in the United States over the course of the pandemic. Both MISC and MISA, or multisystem inflammatory syndrome in adults, are severe disorders that might occur following acute SARS-CoV-2 infection, particularly in younger individuals. There have been over 4,500 patients meeting MISC case definition criteria reported to CDC. Because these tend to follow the trend of COVID-19 cases, we expect a rise in MISC and MISA reports in the next few weeks to months. Next slide. Four recent studies describe the increased risk of myocarditis with SARS-CoV-2 infection. In a retrospective cohort using data from more than 800 U.S. hospitals and a recent national study from Israel, patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection had a 16 to 18 times higher risk for myocarditis compared to patients without SARS-CoV-2. Risk of myocarditis among individuals post-SARS-CoV-2 infection was also 6 to 34 times higher than the risk among those who received mRNA vaccine in two other U.S. studies. Next slide. As ACIP has discussed before, myocarditis following mRNA vaccination is rare, has been primarily observed in males under 30, and particularly after the second dose. Both the benefit risk assessment presented to ACIP in June for adolescents and young adults and in July for 18, adults 18 and older showed that the benefits outweighed risks of mRNA vaccination. Next slide. These are three recent publications about the clinical course of myocarditis following mRNA vaccination that we wanted to highlight. <clears throat> the first is a case series in pediatrics of seven hospitalized males which describe rapidly resolving clinical symptoms. The second is a case series from JAMA Cardiology of 15 patients hospitalized after Pfizer-BioNTech vaccination. There were no ICU admissions, and overall they had benign short-term hospital courses. The final is a multi-center study across 16 hospitals that compared patients with post-vaccination myocarditis to a cohort with MISC. These patients also had mild hospital courses with quick clinical recovery, and on follow-up, all patients had normal ventricular function. Next slide. In addition to that published information, available data from VARES and VSD that we've seen today show consistent clinical outcomes. Among the cases reported to VARES in 16 to 29-year-olds, 93% of patients were hospitalized and 4% were admitted to an ICU. The great majority were discharged to home and additional follow-up is ongoing. In vaccine safety data link, 94% were hospitalized with a mean length of stay of 1.9 days. Four of the 16 were admitted to an ICU and 100% were discharged home. There have been no confirmed myocarditis deaths reported in these systems. Next slide. In summary, COVID-19 incidents and hospitalization rates are increasing rapidly. Rare myocarditis occurs after mRNA vaccination more frequently in males. Myocarditis can occur with SARS-CoV-2 infection and at higher rates compared to myocarditis following mRNA vaccine. Young adults hospitalized for COVID-19 had an average length of stay of five days with roughly 5% requiring mechanical ventilation. COVID-19 deaths occurred and varied by age. Those who were hospitalized following post-vaccination myocarditis have had an overall shorter length of stay, and there have been no post-vaccination myocarditis deaths confirmed to date. Next slide. Next, I'll move to the quantified benefits risk analysis of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. We used a similar direct estimation approach described previously to explore benefits and risks per million doses of vaccine. Calculations for the benefits of vaccination were based on age and sex-specific case incidence data from CDC and hospitalization data from COVID-Net. We used vaccine efficacy from the phase three trial and assumed benefits for a 120-day period. Next slide. The potential harms of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine were estimated per million doses by age and sex using VAERS data for cases received and reviewed through August 18th within a 21-day risk window since vaccination. Next. Because cases have been increasing at rates not seen in prior analyses, we made a few adjustments to estimate the benefits. We used a multiplier of 1.5 for case incidence rates to account for increasing cases. This was estimated from the CDC forecast shown earlier. For hospitalization rates, we used a four-week average of weekly rates during July 10th to 31st for more stable estimates by age and sex. These averages were multiplied by a factor of three to account for projected increases in hospitalization through August. 
Additionally, after looking at the benefits over a 120-day period, we'll show estimates for benefits at 180 and 365 days to account for future benefits that would accrue beyond four months. As mentioned earlier, the following estimates are framed around today's policy discussion about Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for individuals over 16. Other vaccines and age groups can be considered with future policy questions. Next slide. This slide shows the number of confirmed myocarditis cases, the number of second doses of Pfizer vaccines administered, and the reporting rates for myocarditis per million doses by age and sex through August 18th. The greatest reporting rates are seen in males 16 to 17 and 18 to 24 years old. Next slide. These next series of slides show the benefits of Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine in black above the line and the estimate of myocarditis cases we might expect to see after vaccine in red below the line. For males aged 16 to 17, we estimate that more than 56,000 cases and about 500 hospitalizations would be prevented per million doses and estimate 73 myocarditis cases would be expected per million doses of vaccine. Next slide. Among 18 to 24 year olds, the benefits are greater and the myocarditis cases are estimated to be fewer. Next slide. In the oldest age group, 25 to 29 year olds, the benefits are even greater and the myocarditis case estimates are fewer. Next slide. This figure sums the previous three slides. Benefits here of the vaccine are shown on the left, with light blue representing COVID-19 hospitalizations prevented and dark blue representing ICU admissions prevented, compared with myocarditis cases estimated on the right. Estimates for females appear above the line and for males appear below the line. Here you can see the benefits outweigh the risks. Next slide. This figure is similar to the last slide, but shows the benefits calculated with lower vaccine effectiveness, or VE, than was found in the phase three clinical trial for both cases and hospitalizations. We selected a VE of 74.6% for COVID-19 cases and a VE of 84% for hospitalizations, both from August MMWRs. You can see here that the benefits still outweigh the potential harms. Next slide. The analyses so far have assumed a 120-day period of time. This next series of graphs shows the estimates for benefits and harms over longer periods of time. For orientation and starting with the 120-day analysis we've already seen, we're comparing COVID-19-associated hospitalizations that would be prevented by Pfizer vaccine in blue against myocarditis cases that would be expected in red. Time and number of days appears on the x-axis and cases per million doses appear on the y-axis. Data for males 16, 17 years old is on the left, and for males 18 to 24 years old is on the right. So at 120 days, 500 hospitalizations would be prevented among 16 to 17 year old males, and 73 myocarditis cases might be expected. As we've seen already in both age groups, the benefits outweigh the harms. Next slide. Now the benefits and harms have been added for 180 days for both age groups. The two blue data points shown we're estimated assuming that the current COVID-19 epidemiology is stable. However, since we don't know exactly how rates might change in the future, we've represented this uncertainty with a lightly shaded blue area around the lines. You'll see that the number of myocarditis cases per million is constant because the risk occurs within a 21-day window following vaccination. Benefits continue to outweigh the harms. Next slide. Last, benefits and risks are plotted at 365 days. The blue area of uncertainty is slightly larger, but the risk of myocarditis stays consistent, and here the benefits are even greater, outweighing the harms for both age groups. Next slide. Finally, the benefits and risks estimated per million doses are summed in a table format, and here we're back to the original model inputs over 120 days. Estimates for females appear on the first three lines and for males on the lower three lines. The potential cases of myocarditis per million Pfizer-BioNTech doses um, by age group appear in the final column. Next slide. So in summary, this direct approach benefit risk assessment for Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine and myocarditis considers the individual benefits of vaccination versus individual risks and considers vaccine against no vaccine. The work group assessed that the benefits of vaccination outweigh the risks for each age and sex uh, group evaluated. And as in previous analyses, that relative balance does vary by age and sex. 
Next slide. So there's the whole terrific team to thank for all their work on this um, analysis and thanks so much to all of our collaborators within CDC and outside CDC as well. Next slide. That's all, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you Dr. Rosenblum. Um, this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Paling, thank you. Dr. Paling? Yes, thank you, I apologize. Um, so first of all, thank you for a very informative presentation. Um, and I really liked how you outlined this. I do hope in the future that as data become available, and I understand we're focusing on this age group because of the BLA, that we will look at similar data um, among the 12 to 15 year olds in the future. The second um, point I wanted to uh, ask about is um, getting back to the same about race, ethnicity. I think it would be really important to look by race, ethnicity. It may be that the numbers are so small that we'd have to put it all together, but I do think that might help us um, as we think about moving forward and um, addressing those issues as well. Thank you. Thanks so much for that comment. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Dr. No, go ahead. <laughs> Is there anything that you'd like to respond to? I was just going to say thanks so much, and that's helpful for thinking about this going forward. Thank you. Um, Dr. Daly? Um, yeah, thanks so much for that presentation. Could, could we go back to the slide that looked at sort of uh, benefits and risks accruing over time? So I, I, I found this very, very helpful because I think we anticipate that uh, benefits are going to continue to accrue over time with prevention of hospitalizations. But what I just thought of is that there's, and you highlighted this, but there's a fair bit of uncertainty in both the hospitalizations prevented and the myocarditis, at least in the context that for the myocarditis, if we look at uh, symptomatic myocarditis, for example, it may be that for many of these cases, we need, we need, to, we need to know what the long-term outcomes for the myocarditis are. And then over time, um, perhaps our estimates of um, hospitalizations prevented will also become more precise so that we can sort of, um, I, I guess it's just a, um, an observation that we can revisit this data as we have uh, better, better information about both the risks and benefits over time. Over. Thank you. Are there any other um, questions? I actually, um, I'm going to take this opportunity just briefly to chime in and say that this uh, particular slide is extremely helpful to me. Um, in that it highlights that the risk that we're talking about following vaccination is generally within seven days, but the benefits um, last for far longer than seven days. And so it's important for us to continue to look ahead, uh, particularly as schools have reopened. And we recognize that there are a significant proportion of our children in schools who have not yet had the opportunity to be vaccinated because they are not eligible for vaccination. Uh, so this is going to continue to be incredibly important for all of us. Any other comments or questions from the ACIP members or our liaisons? Dr. Long. Yes, I, I'm sorry. I'm going to chime in again. I only have a very brief comment. And I, you know, clinicians are important because we're very specific about use of language. And this language is about the use of the word myocarditis. This is pericarditis first. It, it, so that if we call it anything short of myopericarditis, I think we're doing an injustice and we also are painting for long-term risk. A much worse risk for sequelae if this were truly myocarditis. Now I'll tell you why you're calling it myocarditis because Cardiologists, when they see these patients, are imposing myocarditis protocols. 
it, to the point sometimes of treating with gamma globulin and things that these patients generally don't need. But when they're looking at the echocardiograms, and I've talked to many of them about the reporting of these, well, we didn't do that echocardiogram to look at the pericardium. And so we, but I say, well, when you look at the MRA, there's the pericardium lighting up. The myocardium doesn't have the ability to cause pain unless cells die. And there's no evidence that there's infarctions anywhere or ischemia of the myocardium. The pain these patients have is pericarditis. And so I wish we could be more careful about how we term this. It's different than the real myocarditis with smallpox vaccine. It's different than the myocarditis that people will read about when they read about myocarditis um, for the lay public. So at, at least we should call it myopericarditis. Thank you. So Fox going down. Uh, thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Or I don't know, um, anyone has anything else? Dr. Lee, this is, this is Amanda. I think um, I just, I wanna acknowledge Dr. Long's comment and just add, I think that um, partially the um, issue is around the word myocarditis. Um, and um, as, as Dr. Oster and others have talked about several times, the, the outcomes of this uh, apparent COVID vaccine-related myocarditis are substantially uh, better and less severe than um, myocarditis that may be caused by other types of um, infections or even vaccines in some cases. So um, I just want to pull out that really important point that Dr. Long said. Thank you. Dr. Maldonado? Yeah, thank you. This is really a very exciting um, opportunity to portray this in this very clear graphically depicted um, analysis. And I think it's really helpful to pull out these kinds of um, risk benefit assessments in a very clear way that you can easily track, um, not only for the informed community, but for the general public. Because I do think, as we all know, um, there is quite a debate in some circles going on about whether children should be vaccinated and what the risk benefits are. So I would encourage, and the AAP also, um, is considering this as well, but I would encourage CDC to post um, in their FAQ sections for the public similar uh, simplified graphics that really do outline the risks um, and the benefits, in particular the long, short and long term, uh, for this age group because it is going to become more and more important as we see additional EUAs and DLAs for the younger age group. So this is really helpful. And to see it on websites in really graphic format would be very helpful. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to suggest we now recess until 45 minutes after the hour, and we will see everyone then. Thank you again to our speakers.